dreamt I assaulted another man on an airplane. Did he deserve it? Yeah, I don't remember what he did, but I ended, he ended but up. But he lo- definitely deserved. He it. ended up losing a hand in the altercation. I remember that much. <laughs> wait, how did he go from? The, wait, that's not an assault. That's a maiming. Like, yeah. How did you go from I assaulted another man in my dream to Oh no, he also lost his hand. Yeah. Like, yeah. Did you feed it into the propeller? Like, what happened? Uh, I I remember hitting him with something so hard his hand came off. Damn, dude. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty. Where weird. does that rank on the hierarchy of violence? Like you hit somebody that's so hard, appendages fly off. Yeah, that's a that's a column B, I think. <laughs> Is that like one of those robots where if you push the right button, like the arms fly off? They just eject. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People need ejectable appendages. That'd be awesome. <laughs> oh my god, do I ever? <laughs> replaceable appendage. I was going to yeah. say, maybe that's the key there is we're all just yeah. old and we want our stuff to be feel new again. That's definitely. <laughs> and it's, it's I mean, I'm not. the only one I know that has uh, torn a muscle making a bed. So. Ooh, tearing a muscle, man. That's a, I'm, I'm beginning to think maybe it was more of a strain because it's, man. it's not bothering me anymore. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, there's still a twinge, you yeah. know, if it was torn, there. man, torn is a, that's yeah. a different level. Yeah. Usually when it tears, you can see it roll. I mean, it it rolls up. It Biden did not up real good. Yeah. But um, he said it was a partial tear. Mm. And uh, the muscle relaxers he gave me were really good. They're not the kind that make you drowsy or loopy which, or anything. Which one was it? Do you Dude, remember? I don't know. I've just, I, I asked because I've never taken a muscle relaxer that felt like it did anything. This is the only one that's ever felt like it's yeah. done anything. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the combination of that with the anti-inflammatory you gave me, but yeah. either way, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know what it was. I don't remember off the top of my head. I took Laura tabs for a while. They were, they worked for whatever they were supposed to do. I don't know if they're technically a muscle relaxer or what they are, but. Laura tab. I don't remember what that is. They were back I'm in the sure. day. It was after I had my bike rack, I guess. I was thinking that. I think that's Percocet. I think so too. I have no idea. It made yeah, me feel great a, though. It's a, yeah, yeah. like my self esteem. Yeah, it's an up. it's an opioid. <laughs> my neck didn't hurt. Yeah, it's what they make hillbilly hair out of. Yeah, you shake it up in a bathtub with a little Ziploc bag, and all of a sudden, like uh. you get the good blue crystals. And, no, never mind. Hey, everybody, this is the Southern Fried Geekery podcast. Um, we are not making bathtub meth. We are recording a comic book podcast, and uh, I, as always, am Caleb Alexander McKenzie, Matt Trogden, and I'm Craig Lance, as you may have recognized from my. Uh, you recognize the tall sexiness of my voice the as tall. is stated in our <laughs> in the book of the week. This Deep week. and sultry. <laughs> tall sexiness. How would you describe it? Like like I can see your voice sounding tall and sexy. Matt Matt is Matt Matt has a robust hmm. and robust and, and strong voice. Like Matt Matt's voice invokes like a Hollywood jawline sometimes. Hmm. And I have no idea what my voice invokes other than like sadness and probably sodomy. Hmm. So I'm not. not well, it does now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now that you put that in our brains, yeah. <laughs> How's everybody doing this week? Doing well. Yeah. Nice. Um, Craig and I actually got to get together and have like an in-person hangout and eat cake together yesterday um, at his daughter's wedding shower. Um, no, her bri- her bri- baby. Sorry, shower. baby shower. The wedding came first. I was there. I did, I officiated it. <laughs> so um, it was it was nice though. There were sugar cookies that I'm a thousand percent sure I'm still high off of. Mm. Yeah, I had to take an extra dose of insulin for those <laughs> sugar I, cookies. I had to take an extra dose of, of of Craig's insulin just to level myself out. It was like I was twitching on the ride home. Yeah. I had to leave early. It was it was a thing. Um, sheet cake, man. That's a weakness of mine. Oh man, it sheet was cake. Sheet cake. Yeah. We told these people. And that we wanted a cake for 30 people. The cake they gave us was probably 14 inches in yeah, diameter was, and 8 inches tall. It was a good hubcap size. We Damn. used a quarter of the cake for Damn. 30 people. It's like, what the hell, man? man? It was a lot of cake. It was fun times, though. Fun times all around. I uh, I, I purchased and gifted uh, Craig's daughter little Star Wars onesies and a, nah. little, a little Star Wars baby's first uh, book. Yeah. And then also Five like a little time stories. Yeah. A little um, baby's history of rock and roll. So I oh said, Oh my God, just I forcing pop, all everything onto this porch. I set pop, pop Craig up, man. It's going to be a good first year in that house. Like there's going to be lots of lap stories. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I love that. I'm also at the age now, like my friends are having grandbabies. So like, I feel like we're like the elder council of, mm. of, um, of geeks. It's awesome. <laughs> Elder Council. It's like it's not not even just babies anymore. It's like oh no, this is grandbabies. Yeah, this we is had time, a guys. Well, this reminds me because uh, you know Wednesdays we hang out at Kapow. Mm-hmm. Uh, not you anymore, Caleb, because I you know you're trying to be an adult. Get but to the, weird. The rest of us do, and 
Matt, were you here last week? Uh, some. Yeah. yeah, and then you left. But after you left, we came back and there was this little kid here that his grandpa was here shopping. And he just hung out, sat down with us and started talking. He was telling us his favorite G.I. Joes. And wow. All of this. And uh, he, I asked him if he played Fortnite. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, no, I don't play Fortnite. I don't want to, you know, I don't like hurting people. He goes, but I do play cards and I gamble. <laughs> This kid's like 10 and he's like, he's like, I do play cards and I gamble and I bet my friend that if I lost, I would play Fortnite with him for an hour. So I lost. And so I was playing, he goes, and so I was in the sniper tower with my rifle. He's like, but I was just looking through the scopes when somebody got hurt, I'd jump down and heal them. And I'm like, we're like, Oh, that's sweet. You know? So he's like, so I jumped down and I heal this guy and he gets up and kills me. He goes, no good deed. He goes, so I, I respawned. He goes, and all I had left was my pickaxe. So I hunted the guy down and killed him with my pickaxe, stole his machine gun and hid and jumped out the window at the re- respawn point and just kept shooting. <laughs> wow. Took one, one, <laughs> one, one play of Fortnite to, to turn, turn this evil. kid into a violent killer. Yeah. They, they broke this child's dream. <laughs> they, they took something that was innocent and pure. <laughs> And within one hour, we created a All I could think was, this is why I don't play Call of Duty, because that's the kid that's just wiping the floor with me. <laughs> and, and talking shit the whole time. Yep. Uh, I'm just not a good gamer. We got to bring that kid into the fold, though, if he's already like rolling Oh, he's already asked his grandpa if he can come by every yes. Wednesday and hang out with wow. us now. So nice. He's going to drop out of law school and become that kid's mentor. <laughs> We're going to water him and watch him grow. We, see no, what see, happens. what we do is we turn him into, like, he's the sleeper. Like, we turn him into the to the. I, I don't know what you're talking about. This kid's parents are going to smarten up and bring, get him out of here real <laughs> quick. Grandpa just lost Oh, custody. I'm sure yeah. of that. <laughs> Why can't we go to Papa's anymore? Well, son, look, we're, we're only taking you out of so many jails. So, well, anyway, I know we all had busy weekends, but did uh, anybody get to read any comics since last we met? Yeah, I did. Craig, you want to go first? Okay, sure. (laughs) That was a random... uh, Yeah, I read some. (laughs) Craig, you go. Okay, so I read... uh, I was hoping you'd say no. (laughs) Birthright number 50 by uh, Image Comics, uh, Josh Williamson, Andre Brayson, and Adriana Lucas. Mm -hmm. This was the final issue in the uh, series, and it ended on kind of a rhyme to the first issue. Uh, I... have, you, have either of you read any of this series? I've read some, yeah. Okay, so the first issue, you know, uh, Mikey goes into the woods and he's mm-hmm. playing ball with his dad and he gets transferred into the other realm. Mm-hmm. This ends with Mikey playing ball with his daughter and she goes into the woods and they can't find her. But then they find her and he's hugging her and that's how it's... Oh. Yeah. So it's kind of a... Psych! A, yeah, it's a kind of a poetic rhyme to the first a completed story the other book i read was well one of the other books was marvel comics x-men number 21 by jonathan hickman and a plethora of art plethora of artists (laughs) can we revisit that hang on there's a gaggle of artists artists, including uh nick dragata who he worked on Mm -hmm. with uh uh, east, well, east of west. East of west. Yep. I was going to say west of east for a second. Mm. Yeah, so that's the other way around. Yeah, I'm tired. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Magellan. <laughs> yeah, this series is finally. I'm seeing where it's going. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it hasn't been ger- going there the whole time, and it hasn't been a fantastic story, but I can, I can see the finish line. Velocity's picking up. Yeah, it, it's it's so good. That first few pages, that whole Namor oh, interchange yeah. is unreal it's so good Did you read that it's on my stack oh I, man. I want hickman to write a namor book please now. yeah it somebody is needs to so good yeah it, the way he writes him is just amazing man, so good and then i don't know if you guys remember but a while back i talked about a book called uh parker reef mm-hmm. the adventures of parker reef and it's, it was a kickstarter book by chris campana uh I read the second volume of this. I got this this week, uh, ordered it through Kickstarter. It's Parker Reef, No Way Home. This is uh, the continuing story of what Chris has imagined for his son that died in childbirth. Right. Along with his... uh, Partner. Yeah, I think they were fiancés, but either way, his... The love of his life. Right. She died at that point in time. And Chris is 
still having a difficult time as you can imagine yeah it's been three years um he will probably always deal with the emotions of this but this book caleb i know you read the first I one did, yeah and it ended with parker getting to see his dad but then getting sucked back into mm-hmm. the after realm now it's with parker realizing he's got to go back to his mom and getting back to living his life in this after realm yeah um really solid book um i will continue to support chris the proceeds to this book uh, um i don't know what percentage of them but a percentage of them go to the foundation he started in their names Mm -hmm. where they support families in needs uh in need uh specifically around the holidays they give presents to kids and things like that that's Uh, awesome yeah so um i know Caleb, uh, I brought it in case you want to read the second issue. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, haven't cried. You can color one. in the coloring book that came with it if you want. Um, <laughs> Wee! So, uh, yeah, this, this is going to be a book that I, I'm going to continue to support Chris. Number one, he's a fantastic creator. Mm-hmm. And number two, um, it, it's not out of pity at all. It's the foundation and all of those sorts of things that, um, you know. I'm, I'm going to promote him on the show when I can. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, in a, in a lot of cases, art, and not not in all cases, but in some cases, art is distilled emotion, right? Like, it's a way to work through the things that, that artists see and they experience in the world. And sometimes that's joy yep. and bliss, and sometimes that's heartbreak and just the shattering of your life. And art is the, the vehicle that they work through those, that the trauma or the joy or the whatever. And this is the way he's helping like, work through his he, grief. And I he think that's says fantastic. it's very therapeutic yeah. for him but he doesn't know if it'll ever be therapeutic enough. Right. So uh, the first page has testimonies from friends of hers from Mm -hmm. her life. Um, One was a kindergarten friend of hers that she grew up with. So you get to read these testimonies about her, and then he does another kind of essay at the end like he did in the first one that tells you where he's at and how he's proceeding. Yeah. So uh, he's just a stand-up guy. It's a tragedy that this happened to anyone, let alone him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm thankful as a comic reader that he could put this into words and come up with a story for his right. son. Because in his, you know, in, it gives his way a son to live through his art. Yep. So if nothing else, I guess that's... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, it's, so. it's incredible. Like I said, I love the first, I love the first, the first book that he did. Yeah. It, so. This is why I don't follow Craig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, equally inspiring. I, I have some very inspiring reads as well, so I'll try not to get overwhelmed. Uh, the first on my stack is from DC, uh, number three of six of Batman the Detective. This is the series by, written by Tom Taylor. Pencils are Andy Kubert. Inks are Sandra Hope. Colors by Brad Anderson. Man, I love this series, man. This is great. And given that it takes place outside of Gotham City, usually it's hard for me to mm-hmm. really get involved in a Batman story that does. But between the writing and the art, uh, this is badass. I, I freaking love the way Andy Kubert, you know, illustrates Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. I mean, he looks like a battle-scarred street vigilante instead of a playboy and yeah. that i i'm all about that man it's the, the art on the two batman books right now yeah. is just top notch man. number two on my short stack is uh number five from aftershock maniac of new york this is the final issue in this arc uh, this is by elliot Kahn and uh, andrea muti the ending of this i didn't see coming um the ending to this is going to piss a lot of people off, I think. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I was a little put off by it at first, and I'm like, okay, well, all right. So, I, 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 so I'm looking for ha- a Hollywood happy ending. It is not. Yeah. And a lot of people would be dissatisfied I, with, without spoiling anything. Yeah, you know, um, American culture, good tends to beat evil. Other cultures, it's not always that way. Well, mm-hmm. and that's not even, that's, that's not part even, of my, That's yeah. you're not wrong. But that's not the 
crux of my point. That's but that's okay. definitely part of it. Okay. So anyway, can I uh, see that? I want to see the art. In it. The volume two is going to come out next year. And he's uh, he says at the end of it. So I'm, I'm gonna, gonna have to pick up the trade on. This. Yeah, I want to see how where they go with the story on this. Um, because there's definitely an interesting hook. I you know it feels like the story was just kind of cut right. prematurely mm-hmm. almost. But anyway, number three on my short stack, I went back to 1986. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> and uh, I found a gem from 1986 celebrating. They're all gems from 1986. Marvel's 25th anniversary. This is a great way to do so <laughs> with a new number one and a new character, Comet. Man, Comets. I'm legit surprised this isn't your uh, book of the week. I, I it was a struggle. It was it. It was a struggle. <laughs> uh, this one was written by Mr. Bill Mummy and Miguel Fer- Ferrer. Arts by surprisingly enough Kelly Jones and Jerry <laughs> Tallock. Surprisingly enough, because he could pronounce that name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kelly Jones. I think I got that one right. As uh, Inspiring story. Oh, yeah? Inspiring. It's about a very adventurous entrepreneurial man who uh, um, uh, is launched into space in his newly created spaceship designed only to follow Halley's Comet and to study the comet, which has been his lifelong Except dream. Except like Jeff Bezos. Yeah, right. And, <laughs> if only. And He is launching himself into space. Yeah, but he, the problem is he's coming back. Yeah. But of course, I mean, it's uh, what happens is an alien spaceship is also following Halley's Comet mm-hmm. to study, and um, there's a collision, and our protagonist spaceship explodes. He dies. The alien uh, reassembles his molecules, and he takes on the powers of that alien force. And since he was adjacent to a comet, he's called Comet Man, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. And um, meanwhile, back on Earth, this uh, the protagonist's wife and uh, business slash science partner is being creeped on by an ex lover who's also part of NASA. Oh, can't have that. So there's struggles there. Can't have that. Struggles. There's struggles. No. Yeah. And uh, that's a deep emotional book, man. It it is. You know, I mean, this is one of those times where the other things that were out at the time really, uh, I feel like, stole the limelight from the story. <laughs> if it hadn't been for Watchmen. I feel like this is the one all the uh, all the uh, talk would be about. It's a shame that that happens. That um, you know well, the, the light was stolen from. When this you piece. said that he was chasing a comet, I assume that he was bitten by the comet and got the propo- proportionate strength of the comet. It, yeah, you know, I can only imagine that that was the original Intent. story. Yeah. And um, since there are so many creators on this piece, you know, you have, you know, storm, you know, brainstorming prevailed. And, uh, at least they, it's good Kelly Jones art. Like as, as you're flipping through there, it's I'm great art. It. Yeah, at least yeah, it's good. Like it's well, no, uh, so with Kelly Jones, I mean Kelly Jones can be be hit or miss. Uh, his stuff during this time, like late '80s, early '90s, like especially his Batman stuff, I really do, like. I really, really dig. But you get the the kind of stuff he's done later, it, like, and I, I don't know if it's just because he's getting older and maybe he has less control or that, what. But it's not great at all. It I think that a lot of times these artists are a product of the time in yeah. which they start doing their art, and you know, the influences leading up to that time mm-hmm. period. And then sometimes they kind of get stuck in that and art moves beyond them. Unless they're J.R.J.R. who has regressed. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting you say that because there was a big kerfluffle on social media or the whatevers this week. Um, somebody complaining about Herb Trimp's, uh, some of his art that he did in the 90s, which he took a very, um, very Jim Lee-esque, Liefieldian approach. Like he tried to jump into that 90s era type of art and it was very much not herb trim um and and of course there was some guy you know, everybody's a critic i guess and, and i say that what? knowing full well that, that we we at least do a little bit of that as well but just people being snarky assholes uh you know oh like be smirching and dismissing i never herb criticize trim. anything so I, just, I only praise like it was to, to be fair it wasn't great art but i don't think most of the art was at that time was great, so that's just... It was a product of its time. Yeah. Well, he was trying to change his style so he could keep a job. Right, he wanted money. Like, he wanted a paycheck. Like, yeah. It's not yeah. even that he wanted money. He wanted to be able to feed his family. So, yeah. it was just some guy with a hot take. And, of course, luckily, uh, some of the 
the bigger names in Twitter just went Shit, ahead and yeah. took that man to school. Is um, that what started the artist versus writer thing? That uh, who knows? No, that's, that's been around that for That shit a while. circles around every three months. Gotcha. Um, and next week it'll be digital coloring versus whatever coloring. Yeah. Um, all I've known is I've been ignoring a whole lot of tweets. That's week. really all you can do. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really all you can do. Like, you know, unless you're wanting to have an actual conversation with somebody. But the problem with Twitter, at least as a platform, is that everybody can see your conversation and jump in with their own two cents that isn't that that's look it's only two cents because of inflation um so that's, that's uh, oh man there. but i also read some comics did you um, this week yeah it took some time i'm about a week behind in my reading so some of these are gonna be about two weeks old which is fine uh, it's you know obviously is it matt just did one from 1986 so um, but this is classic oh yeah it's classic all right <laughs> it's like an oldsmobile cutlass <laughs> with three up caps man those things are beauts <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I also Especially jumped into for old band. Yeah. Dependable. They are dependable. Yeah, well, it depends. And old, they go hand in hand. Just got to make sure oh, no man. leaks. Um, I hope not. <laughs> sad day my dog is in diapers right now. It's a hell. It's a hell I didn't expect to live in. Anyway, um, Hellions. Uh, either of y'all reading Hellions still? No. Um, Sassy Mr. Sinister is literally the best thing. It is the reason that this X-Men needs to go on forever. Um, Hellions is being written by Zeb Wells, uh, Stefan Segovia. Uh, David Curiel is doing some of the colors, and Ariana Mayhair is doing the letters. I love this book. This was like the first. So obviously, Hellfire Gala is going on right now. The the Mister uh, Mister Sinister Havoc and Psylocke. Uh, I guess it's Betty. Um, they all decided to go to the Hellfire Gala, but they left all the the, the crazies at home, like you know, Wild Child um, and 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 uh, Mommy and the whatever the little. I, forget, I don't even remember her name because I'm not steeped in that world. But uh, Orphan Maker and Nanny had to stay home. Uh, Empath had to stay home because he's a fucking psycho. Um, Gray Crow had to stay home. Um, but, of course, they didn't stay home. <laughs> they wanted to get dressed up and go to the ball. And so they did. And Nanny gets shit-faced and decides to murder Mr. Sinister. <laughs> and problems ensue because so, that's what happens. Yeah, so one really cool thing about the Hellfire Gala is the designs that they've come up oh, for absolutely. the costumes for their... I mean, that had to be a, a lot of fun for the uh, artists to be, you know, hey, we need a fancier mm-hmm. version of their costume. What's fashion? Dude, fashion and comics go back. I mean, yeah. I mean, they, they, hand in hand. So uh, it's been. Emma yeah. Frost's costume is uh, pretty revealing, even for Emma even Frost. Even for Emma Frost. <laughs> yeah. Even more so than normal. I, Colossus is still does all the things that it needs to do. Yeah. Um, that is that is a. Is he I mean, at the gala? I haven't seen him. He, he he'll be popping up in one. So his design was like a big thing. Oh, okay. um, that it won an award or like it won a contest to see who was going to do what. But uh, dude, Havoc's costume and this is cool. So Havoc's got this almost like a trench coat thing um, with these white bands, kind of emulating his old helmet that like circle his body. So so yeah, man, it's 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 really cool. And then I was kind of disappointed in um, in Psylocke's. Uh, I, I still I'm I'm not. Hand in hand with whether Psylocke or Braddock is who is who right now. I they're don't know they're how that different works. people now, right? Yeah, I just don't know which one is which because I'm not really paying that much attention because I just want action. No one's attention. paying attention to that anymore. <laughs> no. Um, so the cool thing is, is that has Sinister, and in the X Men book, there is a Sinister file on each of the new X Men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Sassy you Sinister. get Sinister's kind of thoughts on each of the the new X-Men group. And I, I can only guess that they're amazing. They're <laughs> just... Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're very sinister. <laughs> um, taking a completely different turn, I also read issue two of The Good Asian, which is a book that we spoke about a few weeks ago. Uh, at least spoke about the first issue. Um, this book is being written by Pornsack Pikachu. Um, Tifingi. Well, we talked about issue negative one. Issue negative one? What do you mean? Well, I mean, you said you... Th- we talked about it. You think it was issue one? Well, it's only issue two. So what issue? It what could have been e- could have been a zero issue, Craig. <laughs> you know how comics work. Um, no, this book is fun. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I've been in a very like noir. Like I even sat down and um, you know watched some nineteen thirties uh, crime noir last night just because it was on Amazon, um, and and I wanted to. So I'm very much in the mood of this. Um, cannot recommend this book enough. For some reason, that's a genre that never really seems to fail me. Oh, yeah, crime just, noir. Yeah, it's just yeah, you got to try real hard not to make it at least baseline entertaining. Yeah. Um, and and they go above and beyond in the Good Asian. So, nineteen uh, thirties, they're dealing with the, the government's 
mistreatment of the Chinese American community. Chinatown's trying to come up and get some at least some acknowledgement and respect. And of course, the gangs, or at least the perception of the gangs, are going to be used to keep them down. You've got a first gener like the first Chinese American cop, um, being put between one hell of a rock and a hard place. So check that out. And then certainly last but not least on my little short stack is Green Lantern number three. Man, this book, I am not a diehard long-term Green Lantern fan, but I, I can't get enough of this book. It's incredible. The artwork is beautiful, and the stakes that are here that are involved in this book, I mean, it's just a lot. I mean, what they, they just, you know, spoilers, I guess, but they just blew up the big Mecha Lantern that powers everybody's shit, and now it's... You know, everybody's uh, in dire straits. Um, it's being written by Jeffrey Thorne, Tom Rainey, and Marco Santucci do the art. Micah At Michael Atea does the colors, and Rob Lee does the letters. Well, maybe um, it'll kill one, you know, a couple of the uh, 80 Earth Lanterns. Well, uh, um, power. So, so it's a common commentary <laughs> on that, but but the, the way that they set it up is, is because Earth is like one of these seven planets, which is the whole thing. Um, go read it. But the, this looks at like really hard at Teen Lantern. It also looks at the uh, the the Lantern that was the star of Far Sector, mm -hmm. um, and who I don't know a lot about. I'm actually going to try to get that trade and go back and read the Far Sector trade just so I get caught up on her. It just wrapped. Yeah, it, it's it's supposed to be amazing, um, and I'm really I'm really down with it. And also they like took half the Green Lanterns and stuck them in a secret Lantern ship and shipped them off to the edges of the universe for something before the thing blew up. So what where they're at, what they're going to do, who knows? Who can say? Um, it's it's an adventure and uh, really good Green Lanterns. The so. artist and the writer, who can say? Well, that's that's true. That that's I would, true, I Craig. Hope they so. do. You have got a him say. there. They do. Fuck have you, say. Caleb. That who that's who can say? <laughs> Damn you and your flawless logic. <laughs> How you like that tall sexiness? I'm gonna just go away now. <laughs> I've, I've been besmirched. Um, no, it's yeah. You've not I mean, been besmirched. No, I, I've obviously I have barely begun to defile myself. That's ooh, Doc Holiday reference. High five. First thing in the morning. <laughs> I'm proud of us. Here we go. Um, it can only forebode good things. Um, speaking of foreboding good things, uh, as we always do, we got together this week and we picked out a single book and we decided we would all read it um, and bounce ideas off of each other and kind of discuss it. And we're going to do that. But as we do that. Um, you should know just to you know gird your loins if you haven't read it. Um, we're going to spoil some things because that's really the only way you can talk about the you know the medium um, as as far as getting into the the depths of the writing um, is by spoiling it. So you know you listen, you made this choice. It's not my fault. <laughs> so you tell your friends. Um, but yeah, just check the time signatures. We'll put them in there. Um, so you, you don't want to ruin your experience with reading this. But we are going to talk about the six sidekicks of Trigger Keaton by one Mister Kyle Starks and Chris. Chris Schweitzer. I can't speak today and it's getting on my nerves. Um, I, I thought this book was a ton of fun. Um, I, I, I really enjoy it and I was expecting to enjoy it and it didn't disappoint. And that's, that's kind of my 30,000 foot take. What about y'all? Yeah, I met my expectations. I went, it gave me exactly what I thought it would. Nice. It, exactly the same. Uh, really kind of a fun mystery going on in this. So the the book actually starts with a conceit that I'm not crazy about as far as a storytelling mechanism where they it's almost a misdirection. So they set you up in the first few pages that like, can give you kind of a plot idea of what's going on. Um, and then three or four pages later, they break and you find out they've been on a movie set. I'm not always crazy about that. I, yeah. I kind of figured that out. Pretty yeah, well. yeah no, it, yeah. It, it seemed like that from the very beginning, but, you know, it, because it's kind of hokey. Um, but I think. I think actually it being kind of on the nose is what I think made work for it. Mm. Uh, I'm not crazy about it. But so essentially you've got these two kids and they're in the middle of a bank robbery. And this is all part of the, the film or the TV shows that's going to be being made. And this, uh, <laughs> this, this very much an American cowboy um, comes and busts in and save the day. Uh, you know, and, and, it's and definitely Chuck Norris. Yeah. Oh, he's, well, except he's, he's a dick, you know, just, again, <laughs> it could be Chuck Norris. Very much Chuck I don't know. I don't know anything about Chuck. No, Norris Chuck Norris is supposed to be like a super nice guy. Is he? Yeah. yeah. I, say, I don't know anything about him. Um, but yeah, it's very much in the homage of Chuck Norris. And of course he's the actor that's supposed to come in and save the day. Um, and you know, of course there's bad Martial guys. In this film. Yeah. His name is Marshall art, um, art <laughs> as in work of, um, because <laughs> that's just who he who he is. Uh, Not martial law, which is how I read it at, at first. I'm like, did they just really drop a martial law reference? <laughs> had to go and back and, and no, that's martial art. Had to go. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's like an homage there. There, there there's the potential for an homage there. But um, no, in the middle of the show, you know, one of the the quote unquote bad guys comes up and tries to get in the way, and uh, you know, Trigger Keaton just punches him. 
and of course they call cut on the set because you're not supposed to punch the shit out of out of the actors. <laughs> of the, Stuntmen. Yeah, it, that's just kind of a no-no. But Trigger Keaton doesn't care because he's Trigger goddamn Keaton and he does what he wants. Um, so this is kind of just who this person is. He's a douchebag. Um, Plus goes, they just gave him a 25-year contract right? or something. So. Yeah, so he can just just be who he is. Uh, and so so as they're breaking, the, you know, one of the child actors comes up and is trying to talk to him. And Trigger just sweeps the leg, like just <laughs> knocks this kid to the ground um, and just proceeds to berate him, let him know how he's not shit, how he's actually ruining the set. And he's just that kind of guy. Like he's a big bowl of nasty. Um, and apparently this is who he is and who he's always going to be. Because somewhere around 40 years later, a another actor um, who is still dealing with this douchebag walks into his apartment, finds him hanging, uh, you know, just with his boots on in end of the game for old Trigger. Uh, and, and this is very shocking because he doesn't seem like the person who would have done this. He's, you know, he's his greatest fan. And so the, the person who finds him is actually this, this person named Miles Wynn. Uh, and Miles is, uh, you know, a co-star in whatever drama that they're going to act. So the funeral comes and goes, uh, and as they're trying to, I guess, pay homage or they're trying to bury this guy, um, these kind of people, it's a getting the team together moment. They all coalesce and, you start finding these other people who were also once sidekick. Uh, there's a guy named Paul Hernandez, which is now a nurse. He like completely left the profession of acting um, because Trigger was just so I terrible. Think he's the kid that got swept. Uh, yeah, I think I think he, I think he like was. Violence. Um, and so you, you meet these other people. Uh, there's Terry Como, who is uh, like Buff Willie Nelson. He's he looks like Willie Nelson got hyped up on roids, um, but is literally the only person here who likes Trigger Keaton. Uh, he's the only one who who thinks that who who bought into Trigger being Trigger. Like is a uh, uh, worships him has, has like a tattoo of him on his chest. Um, just this big big dude uh, that that's staying in the stuntman game. You've got another dude named Tad Haycroft. He's also just kind of a nobody. You've got Allison Saint Marie who is a kung fu hero in her own right i guess by this point um and richard brannigan who's this other sidekick so anyway they all get together and they're talking about i mean they're kind of back and forth about how just terrible he was and of course you've got the one guy who's like no that's that's not true at all um but but something happens and they start to put two and two together and realize that all is not what it seems um what looks like a suicide is probably not a suicide and Maybe they have to figure out who killed him, which, I mean, the laundry list of, is, is long. I mean, I mean, even as these guys are um, getting together and talking about this, some other stuntmen sitting behind them hear them, hear, you know, buff Willie Nelson uh, praising Trigger Keaton, and the stuntmen aren't having it. They're like, no, fuck that. That dude's an asshole. Like, if you talk bad about him, you talk bad about, you know, if you talk well about him, you're turning your back on every stuntman who ever worked in the game. So they have this big altercation uh, with, with a headbutt, nonetheless. Uh, yeah, just, I, yes, just, just I was going to bring you know, that up. Just, just, <laughs> just making making it note. I actually put on our Instagram page. I, I noted the headbutt, so Sweet. be proud. Yes, um, pay attention, kids. It, it, it's this, this really cool fight scene that, that is choreographed incredibly well. And so by the end of it, um, what you end up with is that there's going to be a stuntman war while they're also trying to navigate the issue of Trigger Keaton's death, which... And what is a stuntman war? It's just like a regular war, but with stuntmen. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Exactly. Um, and that's where they end this first Does issue. Does not sound good. Lots sounds of, amazing. <laughs> lots of lots No, of I mean, it sounds good for us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Doesn't but if you have sound... a stuntman war, does anybody really get... like? If they if if there are any casualties, doesn't that mean that they did their job wrong? That they're not good stuntmen. Mm. Mm. We'll have to see how it should plays be, out. Deep should be Patty Lane. Uh, yeah, just went for went for the gusto there. That's where um, I got my line also from the at the opening. You should have known it was me because I sounded tall and sexy. <laughs> <laughs> One of the characters says yeah. that in this. Well, that's the that's that's the Buff Willie Nelson. Yeah, Buff guy. Willie Nelson. He turns around, and is like, "Of course you knew it was me. <laughs> Sound tall and sexy." Uh, it's no, dude. I, so I love Kyle Starks. I love Chris Schweitzer. Um, when these two were working together on uh, Rock Mountain, Rock, Rock Candy Mountain, I fell in love with them. I've been waiting for them to get back together um, because it's just just so damn good. Kyle Schweitzer's art. For me, I love Chris Starks, and I'm, I'm not I'm not setting him on the back. You did that completely backwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You Sport try again. Kyle Schweitzer and Chris Starks. Chris Schweitzer's <laughs> art for me is the draw. Um, I love Kyle Starks, and I don't mean to set him on the back burner by any means, but I want to kind of start with the art. Um, his his cartooning 
is is to me top notch. Yep. And especially in the way that he tells his story, like he has a, <laughs> he's not hyper textured, but he doesn't he doesn't he uses the lines everywhere he needs to, and he's got a just a. If you look in here, his lines are almost all uniform. No, they are all yeah, uniform. They are, they, it's like he used a felt tip pen the, or the something. The weight of his line is so yeah. fucking consistent throughout here; it just makes you sick. Um, <clears throat> and that's the kind of thing you get from from him constantly. And not only that, but his like his pers- it's it's really easy to miss the perspective that he uses. But the be, because the art is so you know, and I'm using air quotes, quote unquote, cartoonish. You you can almost think lean into the simplicity of it and miss everything. The perspective that he uses in here is so cinematic, like like the the angles that he chooses to use, the can't, the way he sets up his scenes, the the cinematography, and, and I use that word not meaning to blend, not taking anything away from the medium of comics. Obviously, comics does it better, and I think comics did it first. But the the camera angles he uses to tell his stories, to lay out the sequentials, I mean the, <coughs> the mastery he has over just a three hundred and sixty degree understanding of of the sets in his brain. It's fundamentally flawless. Like I love the way that he lays everything out. Um, he 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 sets out a choreography in the fight scenes that 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 you can just like you don't even need words to follow it. It's just a, it's kind of you know Warren Ellisy in in a sense. I know that's kind of always our go to when we're talking about choreography, but um, I just I really I really dig the way that he lays out stories on the page. Um, and, and the way that he embellishes the, the these very exaggerated characters, uh, I, man, I, I love it. I, I think it's it's some of the best artwork, like some of the best cartooning, um, being done in comics right now. Uh, he's just to me the dude's a, is is damn near perfect. Yeah, I love the fights. So of course, any anything that uh, Kyle Starks is attached to that I've read that has a fight scene in it mm-hmm. is always. Always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the best example of that is Sex Castle. Mm-hmm. Go back and read uh, Sex Castle. That one is got. Of course, it's nothing but a. Re, it's nothing but an excuse to have a fight scene uh, in every, basically every panel, and it's just right. amazing. And it's been optioned. I was like, oh my god, they've optioned Sex Castle. I forgot about that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's reminded me of that a lot. But I, I love the. I love the. Uh, the main character, well, I say the main character, Trigger Keaton in this book. I freaking love him be, you know, the asshole that he is and how quickly he's dispatched. Uh, it's just a great, great character representation. Um, the banners at the funeral. Yep. God must have needed a little more kung fu in heaven. <laughs> I laughed out loud at that. <laughs> That's amazing. Kyle Stark's writing is freaking great. Uh, one th- one cool thing I think he did in this, which I mean, there's a lot of cool things, but mm-hmm. one of the cool things that he did in this was you kind of have a, this trigger that happens with the suicide. Mm-hmm. Within a couple of pages, he's e- able to work in the suicide prevention phone number in there right. without it feeling ham fisted or mm-hmm. whatever, mm-hmm. and and kind of has a PSA in there about if you need mental health right. or help, help go get it. Here's the number to call. And it and it comes across just natural because they're doing a pub, publicity mm-hmm. for the funeral, right. which is you know it, is anything more Hollywood than that. Um, but because of that, he's able to work that in in what could have been a potentially triggering couple of pages for right. somebody. No, absolutely. Shall I read the back matter in this? I did not have a chance. So. I glanced. I glanced through quite a bit of it. I didn't. I'm not going to uh, sit down and. You should have read it. If okay. You if you disliked Trigger Keaton before, oh, uh, yeah. you read this. And that is uh, fuel to that fire. I, I goes to a strip you. club called the Glory Hole. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's yeah. This is one unlikable son of a bitch. When he sweeps the kid at the beginning, and he says, "No one help him up. If you do, <laughs> I will karate chop you in half." <laughs> <laughs> karate chop you in half. That is so eighties, man. Right. That just cracks me up. Well, and that's the kind of, like I, I love. I love the gusto and the bravado that that Kyle Starks brings to. Not only his stories, but just the the dialogue. Like that's that's part of what I love about about Kyle Stark's books from all around. Like the stories are just next level. They're they're ridiculous, which they should be, and they they are beyond the pale as far as like you know the the hor- the horizon of reality. But it's it's just the jokes, like the, the the dialogue that he does so well, just elevates what you see on the page. For example, 
Trigger turned slow and then moved as moved as if he was made of lightning. <laughs> he slapped the gun out of the man's hand and deconstructed it in midair before punching this human mountain so hard he crumpled like a Christmas crown. <laughs> now, I did love the movie posters at the end. Yeah. I did look through those. Uh, I, 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 man, I just I cannot wait to see where he goes. He goes with this. It's it's gonna be fun. obviously it's gonna be amazing. We've got a stuntman war coming. Yeah, um, we've oh, got a mystery to solve. I mean, there's there's things set up here. No, dude, it's perfect. Like the it it, it really is. That's how you do a first issue. People. Yeah, man, this well, is great. And Kyle Starks, uh, he, almost uniformly in Kyle Starks books, he does his first issues really well. Like he he has got the the mechanics of the quote unquote getting the team together mm-hmm. down packed. If you read this, if you, I mean, if you read any of his books, his his opening first issues are just they're I don't know that they could be any better. I really don't like there's there's not like you can nitpick it if you want to. But I think if you want to nitpick it, you're missing the point of the book. Like this book mm-hmm. is not something like that. But he, he just gets the mechanics of these stories. He really does like the way that he I, I would love to sit down and talk to him about his the way that he sets them up. Like, I'm curious if he sits, you know, if he sits down and he makes like a board of post-its and he puts down like like how he actually orchestrates and formulates kind of his first issues and his stories because he. He does it seamlessly, and and this is true of all of his books, not just not just the ones that we've talked about. I mean, any of them, especially the wordless, violent ones, right? No, Which yeah, is even he, harder. Yeah, no, he he does a fantastic job. I mean, I think the first issue and the last issue probably are the hardest, as not a writer, but it would seem to be the first and the last. Mm-hmm. Because you got to hook somebody at the end of the first issue to get them to come back for the rest of the series, and then you got to nail the landing at right. the end. So, um, especially yeah. on like I don't know if this is a six issue series. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I think that's what you just said is probably extremely true. Of like the smaller the story is, the more important that that is. Like you've got to you've got to create a world in that first issue. Like you got to blow it up to get to encompass everything you want to encompass, but it can't be so large that it just drowns out the actual story. And you've got to be able to wrap everything up into a nice, neat bow, um, or, or at least ha- to have some type of closure there. So, so like the yeah, point A to point Z in there is is got to be one of the hardest things. Um, well, and I mean, you can tell how hard it is to write a number one. I realize a lot of this is specul is speculators out there as mm-hmm. well. But the drop-offs from an issue number one to an issue number two are astronomical. Right. Again, part of that speculators that are buying the first issue yeah. because, you know, that's going to be the one that's first appearances of everybody or whatever. But it's a, a lot of that's also that the first issue doesn't land. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, to me, that is at least some, you know, validation of the truth that writing the first issue and sticking it where – You've got a hook to get people to come back for the second issue. Right. It's not an easy thing to do. And as we said, Kyle Stark seems to do it consistently. Yeah. And again, this this issue has everything you want in a number one. You introduction of characters. You introduce where the plot's going. And then just some fun stuff like Stuntman Wars. That's that's what it that's what I think I think I love about it is his his formula is not complicated. It's not overly complex, right? It's just fun. And he's able to pad enough, uh, you know, texture around it to, it, like I said, it's not complicated. It really is. It, it you know, it's kind of a bare bones detective story, but it's just fun. And and there's so much ridiculousness around it that it just blows it way out of proportion for what it should be. It's it's great. It's it's almost like when Ice T has those really great moments in Law and Order. It's just like wait, this just went from being a really like simple procedural that is confused because somebody had to explain to Ice T what murder was. <laughs> like it's it's just that beauty that that Ice T's the the audience in that show oh 1000 they use him to explain the stuff <laughs> so john mulaney's uh, bit on that if you've never listened to it is is incredible but um no i'm on this it's on the pull list i'm gonna stick with it uh, i was always gonna stick with it because i love these two um check it out it's fun stuff are y'all what, what are y'all feeling yeah i'm um, on it yeah. staying on it Definitely. three for three yeah boom <laughs> doesn't always happen but three for threes on this one it's yeah. it's, it's gonna happen hey, i could have predicted that it's the hotness it is. It's the hotness. This is this is already on my my short list for the best of for the year, um, after even after one issue. So, well, what else? What'd y'all read this week? 
I'm tired of talking. Okay. Well, I'll go next since I got my stuff out here. Nice. Um, you know, a lot of times we give a recommendation for our Wednesday pickup books and then we never talk about it again mm-hmm. because either it's a crap book and we don't want to shit on it or it's just wasn't as good as another book or we read that we decided to talk about or whatever. I recommended Bunny Mask last week. And this is uh, Aftershock Comics. Paul Tobin is the writer. Andrea Muti did the art, which was why I wanted to see the art in the other book. I wanted to see how it compared. And Taylor Esposito does mm-hmm. the lettering in this. So, Rook, I think that might be Andre. Andre, I yeah, think it, it. I think it's Andre. I, it, yeah, it's one of those names. It, yeah. It's yeah. I'm not sure um, <clears throat> their pronoun. So, even if sorry, Mister yeah. or Mrs. Muti. Yeah. So this book starts 14 years ago with a little girl getting her teeth chiseled by her father, as you do. Man, oh, I mean, how many times did we go through that? Right. And then it it switches to Tyler, the uh, nurse that works for CPS that's going out to this little girl's house to do a welfare check on her. And as he gets there, Mr. Foster, the father, stabs his partner with a teeth tree branch and then knocks him out (laughs) Tyler wakes up in a cave where he's told that he will start digging because the snitches which are the voices in Mr. Foster's head have told him he must dig in this cave until he finds whatever it is they want him to find but he's tired and his arms bigger one arms bigger than the other from digging so much he wants this guy to do it and that if he tries to escape, he will shoot him in both knees, both ankles, and since he assumes he only has one dick in the one dick. So wait, wait what? <laughs> Time out. I need you to back up. <laughs> There's just some hills have eyes bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, Don't worry, I'm gonna leave my daughter B here to help you. So the girl he's been chiseling her teeth is now here helping this man dig. So after a while, they're all this is so predictable, right? Right. (laughs) So after about two weeks, dude comes back, you know, they've been down there digging and it doesn't really tell you what happens in the off time, how he keeps them stuck there and how they don't escape. But B and Tyler form a a bond, Mm -hmm. as you would expect. And he promises that he's going to help her escape. Well, after about two weeks, dad comes down and says, don't worry about it. B won't be back. And dude's like, um, that's oh, a problem. Yeah, that's what's, you know, and he's like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I, pol- you know, I promised you, you know, in his mind, you think of that. And so he keeps digging. A few days later, he finds an entrance into another cave. Well, Mr. Foster's very upset that he found this entrance into another cave because the snitches had promised him he would be the one to find it. So he responds the way any normal sane man would, and he shoots dude in the kneecap. Yeah. So, yeah. But then, out of the shadows, comes a woman, child, teenage girl, not really sure, wearing bunny ears. And she says, I smell sickness. And she's like, is there sickness here? And Tyler points at the dad and she goes off running and kills the dad because he's sick and then comes back and licks his wound on his knee. So then (laughs) Tyler wakes up as he's being put into a ambulance and he's like, wait, what happened to B? They're like, well, there's no B here. I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, well, am I going to lose my leg? And they're like, there's nothing wrong with your legs. And he pulls up the deal and his leg's completely healed. And off he goes. 14 years later, he's driving around in New York City and sees an art exhibit. And he jumps out of the car, leaving it running in the middle of town. And all of the art in there is pictures and drawings of the bunny mask woman yeah that he ran into and he runs into the artist and he starts talking to her and she's like oh would you like to buy some and then she goes you know you look really familiar did did i work with you before and he's like wait you're you're her aren't you you're b and he's she's like yeah and so of course they have this moment of connection and everything 
switches back to the sheriff in the town going to the old foster residence. Mm -hmm. He finally finds the caves and finds B's body. Hmm. So obviously B the artist is Bunny Mask. But, you know, interesting stuff. I've you know, I love my horror books. Uh I've recommended something is killing the children. Yeah. Someone is killing the children. It fantastic book. I've recommended a lot of uh Proctor Valley Road. You guys need to listen to me on these horror books. <laughs> Matt does consistently, so I feel like you're just speaking to me. I mean, I listen. <laughs> so, and, and I'm speaking to the audience mostly. But um, go get this book, the art. Um, Andrea Andre Muti. Uh, and there's not a direct line to Tyler Crook. Yeah, but it's very similar art. Oh, in, nice in coloring. Um, yeah, if you liked what happened in uh, Harrow County mm -hmm. art wise, you're going to like this. And that's why I wanted to look at the uh, book that Matt was talking about, because I wanted to see if it was the same art style. And it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's their, their art style. It's a beautiful book. It, beautiful watercolors. Uh, it, creepy vibe through the whole thing. Well, that, that creepy vibe that you were just talking about. So as you were as you were explaining this to me in my head, obviously I'm trying to find a reference point because I haven't read the book just based on what you said. But some of the like the psychological uh, horror of what you're talking about reminds me of Cullen Bunn's The Unsound that he yeah. did, like with the with the woman who has like the paper plate face in every like the just the as crazy as that as that book was. Um, so there's a twelve panel page, sixteen panel page in here where he's first getting to meet B mm -hmm. and she says, Oh, don't, you know, don't worry about my dad. He's crazy because he hears voices, but don't blame too much because the snitch speaks to him. And sometimes he speaks to me too. And her eyes in that panel are ab absolutely horrific. Jesus. She has seen some shit at eight years old. Yeah, I'm gonna go grab this book off the shelf if it's at the shop. Yeah, uh, I want to. I want to check this out. Yeah, it's and if it's not, you can borrow mine. But yeah, really solid, solid first century into it. I was gonna talk about the Parker Reef book, but then I read this book and I felt like um, people needed to know that this is a book they need to be on. If you're in, <laughs> if you're into horror and horror comics, yeah. not horror comics, but horror comics, this is definitely a book you should check out. When did you read that? This morning, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Just curious. Why? Maybe I know you didn't sleep last night, so I thought maybe you read it yesterday. No, I read it today. Mm. Okay. He was saying it maybe gave you nightmares, but yeah, yeah that doesn't oh, line up. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. No, I read it this morning. I won't sleep tonight because, <laughs> because uh, of the yeah. book. Came in looking a little pale. Now yeah. I'm starting to understand. Yeah, and that might be why. Yeah. <laughs> is because it's put the fear of, of bunny Bunnies. mask into me. So this is one of those situations to where I saw this being... Like number one, you talked about it, but I also saw it being being offered. I dismissed it because of the title, yeah. and that's a lesson for me. I guess it's a lesson for all of us. But like the title is just something like ah, good. The covers what drew me in, though. right? I, it, yeah. <laughs> but I was I was sitting there saying I was like ah, I'm not going to read something called Bunny Mask, and I was wrong, and now I need to remedy that. <laughs> so uh, check that out. What is it about that? That that's intriguing. Why does Bunny mask as a title turn you off so much. I don't know. I just saw it and I was like, yeah, I didn't put a lot of. I mean, hmm. honestly, if you don't see all the blood and everything, it's a girl running around in a bunny mask. I mean, it's well, there's blood all over the cover, so yeah, it's, it's right. not hard, hard to ignore. To, to yeah. ignore the cover, yeah. No, but if you see this on just like a list of things that are coming out next week or whatever, and all you you don't see the cover at all, you just see something called bunny mask. To, and, and to be fair, for me, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but it's from Aftershock Comics, which is. Which is hit or miss for me. Um, and they, so, they started off when they first started. They It was about 100%. They're not quite there yeah, anymore. Yeah, but, yeah. A, a less than intriguing title from a publisher that I'm not 1,000% um, faithful in. I was like, okay, I don't need to. Like, maybe I, let me just move past this. I will tell you I'll be getting any book that Muti is on going right. forward because the art's fantastic. Yeah, I've read two books that Muti has done. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of reading books, tell me what you read this week, brother. I went back and read <clears throat> from David Lapham, uh, Stray Bullets, Volume nice. One, The Innocence of Nihilism. 
I've read some stray bullets here and there, but I'd never read the beginning of the stray bullets series. And I got a, I found this on the secondary market, decided to give it a try. This is, you know, everything, penciling, inks, lettering is all done by David Lapham. It is, it was produced and edited by Maria Lapham. It was originally published under their own, uh, publication called El Capitan and was later picked up by Image uh, because it became a very successful. Mm -hmm. This, uh, the art on this, this whole series is really good. I really like the art in this book. It's just black and white. There's not even any grays. I really appreciate I like black and white books. Mm -hmm. I don't want all books to be black and white, right. uh, obviously. It, need, it needs to have a purpose when it is. But I do really like black and white books, especially when they're small independent books. I mean, this is, this is a, you know, set in the real world crime story. Um, so it just gave it a very noir feel almost, mm -hmm. the, being the black and white uh, setting. I recommend this a lot if you're into crime stories. Uh, great characters, great art. Uh, each story uh, is generally independent of the others. Some are loosely connected. Some are not connected at all. Uh, feels kind of like one-off episodes of a television show almost. Right. Uh, there are some recurring characters, but not many. But what this is not <laughs> is a feel-good book. <laughs> you don't say. Uh, these are um, a mixture of bad people, good people, but everybody pretty much makes bad decisions. Right. And it's just, it's. I mean, so it's human. It's very human very it's you know the last <laughs> the last page of the last story is freaking bring down city man oh. it's gut-wrenching it's like oh my god this is not a feel-good book it's compelling you keep wanting to read to find out what the hell is going to happen to these people what is this what kind of choice is this person going to make next that yeah how bad you're going to regret for the them thing. even yeah. if they don't have the sense to regret it you're like my god so you just, I mean, it feels, but it feels very realistic as far as just being, you're put in this world of bad decisions. That's just the best way to sum it up. It's like, almost a parallel to 100. So I haven't read Stray Bullets, uh, but there's almost a parallel to 100 Bullets. With it's that. much more realistic than 100 okay. Bullets. Yeah, it, gotcha. 100 Bullets I loved. I right. freaking adored 100 Bullets. But there's nobody in that story that is, that's, that's innocent. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a person who doesn't earn something and they, they aren't given what they've earned. Hunter bullets level. was, you know, Hunter bullets was very, very compelling. Mm -hmm. The, in the stories, you know, much, it's very, very linear. Mm -hmm. This is not, this mm -hmm. is one off. So again, this feels like episodes. Right. I think as this goes on, it gets more and more interconnected. Cause mm -hmm. I've read some later stray bullet stuff after it was, um, it started being uh, published by image, right. but this, you know, but as, and again, as far as a first piece of work from a creator, it's really strong. The art is great. There's one story in here I have to share. This. There's a it's a it's a kid's Halloween story, and uh, the main character kid is wearing a specific ghost costume. Well, this ghost costume is based on a ghost costume that David Lapham wore as a child. Um, fucking terrifying. Uh, yeah. What the fuck? It's yeah. I mean, this is nightmare fuel. This kid's ghost costume like the is, actual, there's a photograph of yeah, the actual ghost of, costume of david lapham's actual costume from nice. a child this is a child without a soul right <laughs> this is a child that 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 comes after you in the night yeah yeah it's amazing my yeah. favorite thing are the little ears yes <laughs> yes and the fact that you know just I mean, yeah i mean it's that is an amazing costume Soulless eyes. yeah just yeah. great great stuff so i highly recommend this book okay um but again, it's um, one that's remained on my like, yeah. like peripheral one yeah. that I haven't gotten to. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely. Didn't he do the art on Feral? He wrote. Feral. He wrote Feral. Oh, he, he wrote, wrote Feral. Feral. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I knew he was connected Feral. to it at some in yeah. some way. Um, now, have you read so one another book that he wrote and did the art on? Um, it was from Vertigo called Silverfish. Did you ever read that? I did not read. Silverfish. I'm, I have a copy of it at home. I may bring it to you because I actually. I'm not sure which one he did first. I know you, you said something about that being one of his first works. So. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. I'm not sure when he did Silverfish, but it's very early on his, his career. Yeah. And it's all done in black and white as well. Uh, and I don't particularly think he stuck the the landing on there, but he did something different with the book that I didn't see coming, so mm-hmm. I respected it. Yeah. Um, but his his work in that book is, is grotesque. I've got some stills pulled up um, that you can see see some of the, the things that he did. Um, I, I love David Lapple, man. I was... What's he? Does anybody know where he's at? Like, what's he been doing? I've not seen him on anything for since a long Ferrell's, time. Uh, I think that was the last thing I saw him on. He's done some stuff since Farrell's, but I don't know what he's been doing for a while. Yeah, yeah he's either. he's to, after Farrell's, he um, was doing pretty much. He was doing everything with Marvel at right. one point, but yeah, since then I don't know. Yeah, I need to figure out where he's at because I. I I, I enjoy his stuff. Oh, yeah. Like I said, this is a book I've been meaning to pick up for a long time. So yeah. the endorsement of it really pushes me yeah. towards that anyway. It always gets mentioned when people talk about crime books. Right. This is a series that always gets mentioned. Um, John Lehman of Chew fame, yeah. he says this is his favorite, one of his favorite comics of all time. That makes sense. Yeah. I can see some of the threads in that from his stuff. So makes a lot of sense. Well, nice. Well... Um, I read a book I'm going to talk about just simple because it's the month to talk about it. Um, it is Pride Month, and this week DC put out a book. It's called DC Pride. Um, well, and it's, it's two out of three that we recommended last week. For. Yeah. Uh, that's what I told you all to go pick up. And, and I did, and it was it was great. It was, it was exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, it's just a series, just a series of shorts, just an anthology book um, focusing on some of the, the queer characters from from DC Comics. Um, some, some of them that we know and that we love like Midnighter and Apollo, uh, you've got Batwoman in here. Um, you've got Renee, Renee Montoya is the question. Some of them that I'm not familiar per se with, which is like the, like this futuristic flash who, who I don't, I don't know who she hmm. is. Um, but you've also got, uh, um, of course you've got Harleen and, uh, Poison Ivy mm-hmm. and their relationship there. You've also got Alan, uh, Alan Scott, the original Green Lantern. Apparently the Harley Poison Ivy thing threw people off. And it's like, where have you been for the past 10 years? Uh, yeah. I, th- there are some people that you literally have to spell it out for them. Hey, we're together. We <laughs> we have sex. I mean, I mean, they did two seasons of a cartoon just to spell it out to people. Yeah. It's, you know, it's... Uh, well, and, and so since, you, since we're just mentioning that, in the actual... In the actual story uh, that that they feature in, there's literally this moment to where they're almost poking fun at the people who just can't realize it, like who doesn't do it. They they have this moment where they're they're talking about going on a date, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, because our relationship, where we have sex and we're together, because we're in a relationship, because that's what people in relationships do." And it's it's all coming from Harley, and she breaks the fourth wall when she does it. Um, of course, as they're you know as they're fighting this giant. Um, plant monster with really weird little cutesy kind of teeth um, but it's just it's really fun and that particular story let me see who wrote who wrote that um, that was written by Mariko Tamaki who I love I love Mariko um, her work is even even when I don't like her work it's still good so to speak yeah. so um, and it was drawn by Amy Reader um, colors by Marissa Louise letters by um, Ariana Maher was it mostly LGBTQ community that wrote and drew yeah yeah, yeah. so almost um Almost exclusively, I, I'd imagine. Yeah, I can't. I can't say like one hundred percent because yeah. there's a lot of names in here I don't know. Yeah, but it was very much the the queer community, queer writers, queer creators, That's the amazing. artists who worked yeah. on this. Um, there is a Mark Andranko writes a really really poignant um, opening to this book, which hits on a lot of levels. I know it's things that I've spoken of several times, but it's just like a book like this didn't exist and it couldn't have existed when I was a kid, right? Like it just wasn't on the shelves when I was a kid. You know, people didn't understand that. Yeah, there there are queer relationships all through your comics, like the X Men. People people didn't connect those dots, um, and we're seeing a lot of that just being brought out and and you know talked about now. But this book didn't exist when I was a kid. It, like, and it couldn't have. Even Midnight and Apollo was like this novel thing that made waves and stuff mm-hmm. when they actually had their first kiss in the Authority. Um, you know, it just kind of broke the mold. So I really appreciate that it does exist. I know there's always a you know a conversation of of when these things come out, like who is it for? And at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The fact that it's, it, good story, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's matter. fun stories. And the fact that it exists, like, you know, look on some level, because, because I heard some, some actually other LGBTQ people talking about this is, Oh, they're, they're just, you know, they choose this month to pander to us and it's a money bump for them. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're right. That's true. But I kind of, number one, I'm okay with that. 
because I don't mind being pandered to. Sure, pander to me. Sure, why not? I mean, that's but, what consumerism is. <laughs> <laughs> the the opposite and the point I made to them is like the opposite of this is is not not being pandered to the opposite is Chick Fil A spending their money to make sure that we don't have rights and that are you know like the reverse for reversing yeah. marriage and and sponsoring like you know, all these anti trans bills that go through our legislation uh, or you know through I don't know how many states now like Chick Fil A sponsored some of that like that's the opposite of that so yeah I'd rather them pander to us on our side than the the opposite of that but again at some level that's what corporations do they right. pander to different groups to get them to buy their merchandise i mean that's it's commercial right yeah. and and that's especially especially when you're talking about comics and the big two and stuff that's that's it, it is consumerist like these these are corporate entities corporate ips they're, that's, in they're this to make money that's their job and so i would now much, get, you know if that is offensive then you know spend your money how you want to right yeah. And, and and I'm not saying that the, that we shouldn't, as a community, demand them to do better. Case in point, like uh, the other the last week, one of the Walton family said announced they were giving a bunch of money to a pro LGBT group, and I'm like, well, that's great, that's wonderful, do that. But also, where were you? Literally four months ago, when they made it illegal to give trans kids medical uh, care, like trans trans affirming medical care, which is the law now in Arkansas. Like, where were you? So it's not it's not unfair to ask them to do more, but. But you have to make sure you're making that point. You, you have to do it in a way that you're not saying, "Oh, just shut the fuck up and go away," like, mm-hmm. like because because they'll go away, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then and then we don't have the acceptance. You don't have the exposure. Um, you don't have the normal uh, normalization. And at some point, it is normalization, like and it should be. Um, but that's that's all well. And the thing is, is that all of these characters exist in the DC universe, mm-hmm. or most of them. Like you said, there was a new Flash or whatever introduced, but. These characters exist in the DC universe Monday through Friday, 12 months a year. Right. Um, they're just putting anthology stories together so yeah. people can find that. Yeah, That's not necessarily a, a good or a bad thing. It's a thing. No, it's a thing that directs the point home of, of this is this is explicitly a queer book, though. And, 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 and they're like going to do it yeah. in a month. They're going to do it in Pride Month. Yeah, I they mean, should. Yeah. Just like they're going to do a... a Black Hero Month and mm-hmm. you know uh, Black uh, Black Pride, Pride Month, books, yeah. yeah. So it, you're going to have that it for different things throughout the year. It's yeah, and, just... I, and I think that's great. And, and so, like, obviously, I'm am more inclined to to pick up something like this because I'm I'm a gay man. But like you saying the the you know Black History Month books when they come out with that stuff, the Black History, the Month, alternate history of the DC universe stuff like that. I'm a white dude, man. Like, but but. I, like those books resonate like across the board. Like they're, they're good. They're good stories. And so why not put like the, and I think a large, large portion of people who get mad at that is because it's not pandering to them. It's pandering to a community. They're not a part of like that shouldn't bother you. Like it doesn't bother me when, you know, if, if they are, pandering if I don't to want to buy it, I can walk right by it. Exactly. I just don't you know, understand. I don't the, have to, no one's putting it in my bag. I just don't understand. But back to, back to this anthology, the DC pride anthology, um, one of my favorite stories in this book was actually written by Cena Grace. Um, and <laughs> I love when Cena Grace gets snarky in his books. It's hilarious. Um, drawn by Roe Stein and Ted Brandt, uh, from, um, what was the, the book with the, basically they had an app for murder. Um, Oh, I forget what it was off the top of my head. This is, this is bad nerdisms, um, and terrible radio. I'm sorry. Um, We'll figure it out later. If you, if it comes to you, let me know. Um, but letters by Adida Bidikar. So the book actually is me- meant to feature the Pied Piper, like this this classically gay villain who throughout history was flamboyant, very much a Jafar character, um, which is a trope, like the villains are gay. Um, here recently, there's kind of been this uh, revision of the Pied Piper, though. Um, still not a good guy, per se, but but almost this Green Arrow-esque, like, like figure Robin Hood thing, steal from the rich, um, <coughs> give to the people who need it. But there's this there's this villain, I'm using air quotes again, called the Little Drummer Boy, and he is apparently in the vein of Pied Piper. He's able to use his drums to, like, uh, hypnotize people or put them in a trance, and he's using it to steal money from these really wealthy people. Well, Pied Piper notices this happening and steps in to, to stop it. And he's like, you know, it's really cute that you've taken my shtick and you've moved it into the, the bass beat age. That's, that's nice, but, you know, let me whip your ass with my flute real quick. Um, but Whip your ass with my flute. <laughs> it's just a... There's something you don't hear very often. Like it's yeah. kind of amazing. Right? Imagine somebody threatening to beat your shit out of you with, with their flute. flute. <laughs> After I was done laughing, I'd probably go to the hospital. Hey, and get my look, those black things are. Eye looked at. Don't don't dismiss a flute. They're light, but they're metal. 
Yeah. And lots of little pointy edges on them, too. Yeah. So you could take it on eye That's with what I things. said. After I was done laughing, I'd yeah. go to the hospital and get stitched up. Yeah, you would have to because <laughs> they would just anyway. – But so so Pied Piper actually talks to this guy, and he's like, so wh- why are you doing this? Like, why do you need to rob these guys? Like, yeah, I mean, they're rich assholes, but it's still crime. Um, and the guy's like, well, look, in my neighborhood, like this kind of very West Hollywood neighborhood, the landlords have hiked up the rent like like five times in the past year. And they're forcing out, like, people are getting forced out of their homes or businesses. This is a gay neighborhood, right? Like, so it's the gayborhood. It, and they're they're being, they're I'd being never driven. I've heard that terminology. Oh, before. yeah, it's a thing. Gayborhood. It's, it's West Hollywood. Um, they're being driven out. And, and like, the only way that they're going to be able to survive is if is if we, we get their money. So I'm robbing these rich assholes. I'm going to take it and give it to the people who own their houses and their businesses so they can still continue to live there because like it's impossible for like home ownership in these places or to own the building like if you own a building in these places you have to spend millions and millions of dollars they don't have that and so you pie piper's like you know what there's a third option here like we we can we can do this like we can we can we can fix this another way so pie piper and drummer boy roll over to find the landlord's house and they find him in his hot tub you know he's telling his person uh you know, i don't know the person who cleans his house or whatever bring his food outside tonight he'll have it in his hot tub being very pretentious um pied piper and, and drum boy get down there and you know threaten <laughs> coerce convince him to go ahead and sign over some deeds um to a, like a five block area everything that he owns and they're going to reinvest and they're going to give it to the people who live there who work there who own that so the community is reinvesting itself and so it remains a a queer neighborhood it doesn't lose its culture it doesn't lose what it is and the story is called be gay do crime and if that ain't the best goddamn title for a thing ever <laughs> i freaking love it. yeah i be gay do crime um you, you need you a get, t-shirt that says that kevin I, I guarantee you he's coming out with one that hour. t-shirt exists it, it, yeah it, it yeah it has to um there, there's lots of stories in this book there lots of them are really fun a point that, that I, I want to make and what makes this book really, I think, special and really important, and it's something I've spoken about before, not all of these stories deal with gay trauma, and I appreciate that so much. Yeah, like like gay trauma, queer trauma is a is a thing. Like, you know, we all, it's hard for a lot of people, and that, that does motivate a lot of us to write in our stories. But some of these stories are just some folks going on a date. Some of it's just superheroes being superheroes and being visibly queer while they're being superheroes. I appreciate that so much because our lives are not, uh, you know, if, if you are a person who's in that community, your life is not uh, framed by your trauma, or at least it doesn't have to be. You, you can just live your life. And and so often we don't see that. And so often in, in media, it's about, oh, somebody's coming out story didn't go somewhere, or somebody's trans story didn't go out somewhere, or a hate crime happened, or especially AIDS. Like, that that is a thing, and, and those stories deserve to be told. But all of the stories don't have to be about that. And mm-hmm. so many of these books are just about superheroes being superheroes. If you need any more incentive to go pick up this book, because it is a little pricey, it's 10 bucks. So if you don't get a discount, you, you, you know, it's it's not it's not a regular sized issue. It's it's thick. Um, I'm not sure how many pages, but this is also the first comic appearance of a character called Dreamer, um, a.k.a. Nia Null. She is a trans character. It's not her first time she was created. She's in Supergirl, the television show. But much like Harley Quinn, who was invented in Batman the Animated Series, whose first appearance in comics is exploding, if you are a speculator and you want to hedge your bets that this character might be somebody, this is her first comic book appearance. So even more of a reason to maybe maybe go collect it, check it out. So besides the fact So you're that, encouraging speculation. In this case, yes. Just yeah. wanna just wanna Queer speculation. That. I'm all for it. <laughs> just. it now a lot of times these uh these books have a uh, partnership where they're sending proceeds to to help different communities. Is yeah. that uh, the case in this one? I believe it is. I don't know that for a fact. Um, I'm sure it says it may say in the back. I mean, manner. if you don't know, that's an answer. Yeah, to. I, I, can't. I just did, I was just curious. You know, because a lot of times when they do these books, they do. Um, you know, like the one was to help the polls. They'll send it to or, the Trevor Project yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I would have which to, helps ease the sting of a ten dollar book too, right? If it's going to let me do some research on that because I'm not one hundred percent sure. I can't say with with certainty that that's the case. I would hope it is. Yeah, I would um, hope so too. Which but, would also ease that whole argument about corporate, right? But, but to, to Matt's point, you know, obviously joking about in, like encouraging speculation and a book like this. I mean, kind of. Yeah, it's a it's a one shot. And I would <laughs> like to see more pro queer one shots in comics. So if 
convince people, give them enough of a reason to go blow these numbers up, maybe maybe there'll be more, and and I get to see these these really great stories. And so, again, most of those characters already exist in DC. You can go read their stories. On a, not maybe not all of them, right? But um, you can read a bunch of their stories on a monthly basis. I know Harley Quinn and Batwoman, you know, is always around. So yeah, you know. One one last point: um, the back cover of this, uh, and this makes me think that maybe maybe they are doing exactly what you said what you're talking about. The back cover is is an ad for P Flag, mm-hmm. and so what if you don't know what P Flag is? P Flag is an organization that actually stands for Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Um, it's a support. It's actually for straight, for heterosexual, cisgendered folks like who have parents and friends who are members of the queer. It's it's a way to them to get together and talk about hey, how do we be more accepting? Mm-hmm. How do we meet the needs of our kids or our family members? Um, they also have some pretty cool swag. So get on there. It's a nonprofit. Um, I, you know, I send people. Little Rock's got a P Flag um, organization. I send people into them to there all the time so nice. if you're if you're a person with a maybe a queer child of some sense and you, you didn't grow up that way you don't know that many gay people you don't know what you're doing you're just somebody like, like what do i do like this is out of my realm check out p flag it really is a great community-based organization that can help you navigate and answer some of those questions um that that you might not know how to how to do that on your own so lots lots of reasons to pick this book up man nice. so i loved it and it's so fun so fun so that's my book of the week. That's what I think folks should grab if they have not already done so. I don't see on their website where the books they're, you know, they're donating anything okay. to anybody. And that, that's fair too. I mean, they're it's allowed to make money. I just was curious. I hope in that case they at least paid the writers and artists this and above and beyond day rate, and maybe that's what where some of it's going. So who knows? But like you said, even if they don't, they don't. Um, I, I would I would it would be better if they did. But they are in the business of making money. Uh, but at least they're or, they're they're advertising for P flag on the back. I mean, you know. Yeah. Also support the Trevor Project, or if you're in Little Rock, check out Lucy's Place or In Transit. If both of those are great organizations. So. Well, all right. We got anything else we need to talk about today? New books from next week, as in the future. As in, if there were a menu. Oh my God! We what would, would set be it? on it. Yeah. Ooh, that's a novel concept. Yep. Yep. Fist bumps all around. Well, tell me. One of you two fine gentlemen, um, what you are grabbing this next week? I'm going to grab Maria Lovett's Luna Luna Number no. Five. Nice from Boom Studios. It's the last issue in this book, and maybe I'll know what the fuck is going on in this book now. <laughs> no, that's I'm joking. I know what's going on now, but um, it is absolutely a beautiful book. And if for no other reason, you should buy it for the art. Nice. I'm going to pick up Planet sized x-men number one planet size that's that's bigger than giant size it is or yeah. island size planet sized friends from marvel comics obviously this is by uh jerry duggan and pepe Larraz. i'm really excited about this creative Dude, pepe's team. a beast um and this is a new x-men team that was basically just officially announced at the end of x Man, 21. So I'm really stoked about this. I, I'm this creative team. I freaking love, man. So yeah. I've got high hopes here. Yeah. Nice. I'm excited about that book. It's and the closer we get to the like you're talking about it, you're starting to see where all the threads, how they're interconnecting. The closer we get to that, uh, the better. And the the more I can see where they're going with this this new relaunch. So there is a book. I'm going to take a page out of um, out of Craig's Craig's book and promote an aftershock book. Um, this is called The Seven Swords, number one. Uh, it is created by Evan Doherty, Ricardo Matina, and J.G. Jones. Um, of course, again, published by Aftershock Comics. So a weary and jaded D'Artagnan of Three Musketeers fame is drawn into a final conflict with the wicked Cardinal Richelieu, whose ruthless quest for power has led him to the supernatural. I'm sold. But the last musketeer can't defeat these infernal enemies alone. No, no. To save the world, he'll need to join forces with seven iconic swashbuckling heroes. Don Juan. Captain Blood, Cyrano de Bergiac, to name a few. Seven swords who must overcome their host of differences and work together if they'll have any hope of thwarting Richelieu's diabolical plans. I'm on board. I love that. Um, the The Greatest Adventure by Will, Bill Willingham, one of my favorite Dynamite series of all times where it brings together all like Tarzan, all of those uh, characters um, from that same realm, and I totally am spacing. It's not the same character as Conan. Uh <laughs> Anyway, so you get you get Tarzan, you get we John retired. Carter of Mars. <laughs> My brain is not 
not a functional element of my life right now. Um, yeah, so so John Carter Mars, all of these characters. This is very much in that vein. It's bringing all of these these tropey type characters into one spot, uh, and I cannot wait to see what they do with it. Um, very much kind of the last time I saw something like that was Five Ghosts, which was yeah. a little different. But um, Three Musketeers is absolutely in my top five of prose books yeah. ever. Hmm. That and Count of Monte Cristo. Nice. So. Well, check this book out. It looks fun. I'm, I, I like the the quote unquote League of Extraordinary Gentlemen thing, where they bring in all these different types of characters from other uh, other publishers, from other other histories, and they shove them together in the same group. Because I, I think it's it's fertile ground for some fun stories. Uh, but I will tell you the one thing that bothers me about this is okay. is Richelieu's not the bad guy. Spoilers. No, I mean he's not in in Three Musketeers in the book. Yeah, well, like I said, spoiler. <laughs> if you haven't read a book written in the 1800s, <laughs> I'm sorry if I spoiled it for you. No, no, no. No, but Richelieu's always portrayed as the bad guy yeah. in film, but he's not in the actual book. He's more of an obstruction, right, than the actual bad guy. That that makes sense. Duke of Buckingham's the bad guy, right? In the, that makes sense. I, I have not. It's I read that in high school, and I don't think I was old enough to really appreciate it yet. Um, it's I, a fantastic book. The, Everybody should read. The film, my favorite version of that film uh, is the one oh, that it had the oh, same. same Charlie Sheen. And, yes. Yeah. Yep. The, that version of that film the is The Disney version fantastic. is really good. Yeah. So, no, I like RoboCop. Also that. <laughs> Also, RoboCop. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's an interesting version of uh, Three Musketeers. <laughs> oh, I thought we were just talking about the movie. It had Chris, the same guy who played Robin, uh, in it as well. That was yeah. good. Um, anyway, so yeah, those are our books. Go check them out. Go, go see all. Matt just threw a, threw a wrench all in these gears. Um, that's that's his plan. RoboCop, yeah, man. He's, he's he's he is the chaotic element of the crew. Um, we hope you come back next week, same time, same. You know, he gets his humanity back at the end. Does he? Does he? Yeah. He shot a dude in the dick. Like, it was impressive. Like a human. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. humans do. <laughs> okay. If one you for each knee, one God for each it. ankle, and assuming you only have one dick, mm-hmm. one for your dick. That's right. Yeah. Making some assumptions there. I said assuming. You yeah. did. If you enjoyed this and you want more of it, you could absolutely come to our Facebook group where we are chatting sometimes. There needs to be more chatter on there. I'm 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 encouraging you and commanding you commanding. per se uh, to go to go chit chat, start a conversation. Um, that way it's not just me posting all the time. And do those things. If you also want to see some of the stuff that we're reading or talking about, we have Instagram and Twitter. We're at SFG on both of those. We also have our handy-dandy email address. So if you want to send us a copy of your book, if you are writing something, or if you're just not comfortable or not a person who uh, happens to be beloved of social media, if it's not a thing you do, you can fire us off an email. We're southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. And if nothing else, you know, wash your hands, be kind to other folks, and go forth and love some comics. Your move, creep. What is that from? Robocop. Oh, shit, it is. I'm a millennial. Is it not? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm just not checking my head at the I'm kids I'm a over millennial. Here. I was like, wait, did I blow that one too? I blew a reference last week. Don't tell me I blew another one. <laughs>